Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, often when I start preparing a weather briefing, the very first thing I look at is just the surface temperature map, and that's what you're looking at here with me. 2 a.m. surface temperatures. We have got sub-freezing temperatures in the mountains and a large warm sector in the midsection of the country, and this just screams highly amplified pattern, where in some places in the central plains, the overnight lows did not get below 80 degrees Fahrenheit last night. Now take a look at the all hazards weather map released early this morning from the National Weather Service. We can see out west freeze warnings, frost advisories, even a winter weather advisory in parts of the northern uh, Rocky Mountains there. South, red flag warnings, which is about fire, heat advisories, high wind watches, and then from Cristobal, look at the flood watch that's now extended to clear up into parts of Iowa and Wisconsin. We've got a very active next few days. We better get talking about it. Over the weekend though, this was the wave that brought in some incredible severe weather across parts of the high plains and northern plains. You can see we do have that very highly amplified pattern which we discussed and here of course is Cristobal more on that in just a few moments. But how this deeper wave came to be was there were actually two separate pieces. One that came out of the North Pacific here and one that came off of the Baja and met together and the lead wave that rushed out ahead of it produced a lot of severe weather. Just looking back here on the severe weather reports from Saturday over here on the left and Sunday over here on the right, you know you can put these two together and we're well in excess of 650 separate reports. But what I want to draw your attention to here was just the location of the severe weather and the type of severe weather. Now I could fill an entire lecture with the explanation and, 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 and what is going on in the atmosphere when we see incredible shelf clouds like this one. Uh, I want to thank Marcus for sending this in. Just a beautiful view here of a powerful squall line moving through this area. Uh, but I, this is, I think, the most important thing that came out of this. For the day on the 6th, that was Saturday, according to the Storm Prediction Center, this is now the new number one ranking day in terms of producing the most what we call significant wind gusts, those being greater than 75 miles an hour. We often denote those with the black boxes uh, over there uh, on the map that is on the right. So when we see these kind of winds from this large what we call derecho event uh, will produce a lot of damage here in parts of Colorado, Wyoming, western South Dakota, uh, and that area was hammered. Now early this morning all that severe weather was moving out of parts of the Dakotas and over into Minnesota so I think a lot of folks here are having a rough night with all of the lightning that was pushing through the squall line that was in this area and we're not done yet it's gonna things are gonna light up here again as the frontal boundary stalls out over that area and gives us another chance of severe weather later on today I'll show you that in a few minutes. But I want to give you the latest on Cristobal. Uh, this was on Sunday. What a dramatic, uh, high resolution, both with time and space here, view of the swirl of clouds around the very asymmetric, very large open circulation here of, um, of Cristobal. Now, as it came on shore, look at the rainfall that we did receive here. And there was some storm surge producing massive flooding along the coast. But parts of Florida, uh, going from north central Florida all the way through the Panhandle back over to Mississippi, several regions here picking up six to 10 plus inches of rainfall. Then if you look, you can see all of the thunderstorm activity that we saw in the north central plains, but we will be talking about this area and this area specifically here at the end of this video about what the long range forecast looks like in terms of precipitation and temperature patterns. So there's a lot to be getting into here. Next, Cristobal will be an interesting system because the um, fronts that usually sweep through knocking these tropical cyclones much more quickly in this direction uh, are stalled. And like I told you, that boundary is going to sit right here. And on it, we're going to be seeing this severe weather again today, which means as Cristobal moves north, nothing's really going to impede its northward trajectory. And, and so it's amazing to be able to see the eventual remnants of this getting clear up into, um, you know, into, into parts of Canada as a subtropical system. What I want to show you is this. Now, this map over here shows you in color coding wind speeds, all right, in five uh, 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 knot uh, um, increments, and then it also shows you the wind direction. And you ready? This is playing through the day on Monday, now into the day on Tuesday, and then eventually into the morning hours on Wednesday. And that's right, if I just kind of back this up here, I just want to stop it right about that point. You can see that on Tuesday evening, Tuesday night, we have a low that's sitting here kind of over the Wisconsin Dells. And then we have a secondary low that's sitting in this part of Kansas and parts of Nebraska. And the winds on the back side of this are going to be ferocious and the winds out ahead of it are also going to be quite strong. Uh, and so this is interesting to actually see two separate lows, one tropical in nature, one uh, mid-latitude in nature.
nature, and they're coming together in this part of the country. So what is this all going to be doing? Well, this is really neat to see. Here is the upper level trough that's sweeping through that's bringing the low over to parts of Kansas and Nebraska. And then coming out through here and eventually ending right over the top of well, central Wisconsin, is what's left of Cristobal. And by the way, in the wings, waiting back here is another trough to sweep into the west. More about that in just a few moments. Okay, what does the surface pressures look like? Well, take a look at this sitting almost right over the top of Madison. We may have a 984 millibar low. That is extremely low. But look on the backside. There's the secondary low right in through this area. And the two pieces are going to not only produce quite a bit of heavy rainfall, but also a, a continued threat of severe weather as we pull in through this week. So from the Weather Prediction Center, this is their seven-day outlook on total accumulated precipitation. And you can see there's a large sector in through here that is expecting to add Add at least another inch and a half uh, of rainfall in this area. Now I want to put out a word of caution, especially in parts of uh, Iowa. The rainfall in the map seems to kind of fill in the gap in through here. We may have some places in there that miss out on some of this, but do notice, I'll come back to this in a second, some areas on either side of Cristobal very dry this week and are going to continue to be dry into next week as well. Showing you the operational European model. Again, can you see how there's a few holes in this? There will be some places here that do not get the heavy precipitation due to the very dynamic positioning of these two separate low pressure systems. But Texas and Oklahoma, heat is on on and it is going to be very, very dry. And if you're in the eastern Corn Belt, you can see your precipitation amounts are, are relatively light overall from this system. We do have that next wave coming in. That's why parts of the Pacific Northwest remain unsettled, as do sections of the Canadian prairies, but getting into southern Saskatchewan looking a little drier. And this area through here, well, we just had all the severe weather come through, so a drier look isn't necessarily a bad thing. But let me now go from the European over to the GFS. And one of the things that GFS does is bring a much broader shield of precipitation through parts of, well, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, getting back into the eastern side of the Dakotas. And it has a much more vigorous way of moving through parts of the Northwest. So with that as the setup, let's kind of walk through some of the details after I point out one last thing to you. Remember, on either side of that path of Cristobal, things are looking quite dry as we go through our next week. So keep that in mind because I show you week two, you'll see a very similar situation. Okay, Storm Prediction Center today, where that boundary stalls out, we still have an enhanced risk in this area of having more severe thunderstorms later on this afternoon. And then on the right-hand side of Cristobal as it moves north into the lower Mississippi River Valley, uh, where we're gonna be seeing our chances for strong to severe storms. In the day on Tuesday, remember now, this is where we have kind of our, I don't know what you wanna call it, our two separate low pressure systems here and here. Parts of Illinois and Indiana have a risk of severe weather and then getting back over into parts of Nebraska, Kansas as well. Then as both systems essentially join and move off to the east, the severe weather threat does move over into parts of, of the eastern Great Lakes here, uh, dipping down into parts of Ohio and Pennsylvania and western New York as well. All right, so from there, let's just watch all this unfold with a high-resolution European model. You see the pieces coming together, and then after that, you notice that there's a lot of action possibly in the northern plains getting up the Canadian prairies, but outside of the Pacific Northwest, we and the northern plains of, of, of the United States and Canada, things just really don't do much. Watch it again, ready? So we play this forward. Here comes the systems we've already discussed. This is working away into Tuesday night, now into Wednesday morning. And then after that sweeps through, some much drier air sets up in place in this area for the remainder of this week. And what we notice is as we pull this on through into the next weekend, yeah, we got some very windy conditions in the central plains, uh, which is going to promote some pretty rapid drying here. But overall, I don't see through next weekend uh, much going on in this section of the United States in terms of precip. It's all going to be up here in the in the northern plains, getting in the Canadian prairies in the Pacific Northwest. That seems to be where the action is going to be, even pulling all the way out through next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So with that, let's go take a look at what that upper level pattern is showing us. And here's some of the questions I'm asking myself. Okay, so we see from the GFS ensemble on the left and the European ensemble on the right, we're now going to go out to week two here. So we're going to start at day 10. We bring in another trough into the western part of the United States, both models picking up on that. I've outlined for you the position of the jet stream. Now, with the GFS, I want to keep a close eye on parts of the southeast. There are a few hints of some tropical activity coming through that area that the GFS is pulling on here. But my four big questions are right up here. One, is the pattern blocked? Is there a Rex block, an Omega block? Are we got a high or a low pattern setting up? 
And right now, while the pattern may be slowing down a bit, I don't see that. Is the pattern shifted north or is it shifted south? Well, the European model, which kind of blends things together a little bit better, would suggest a more northern shift, which could allow for some better warmth pushing farther to the north. Uh, what are the major upstream and downstream features? I'm going to focus primarily on the upstream feature of this trough over the Aleutian Islands here in a few moments. And I'll give you a quick rundown of what the teleconnections are doing and then go into more detail in my Wednesday long range update. But given that, look at what week two now looks like. So we discussed Canadian prairies, north central United States, possibly having the more unsettled pattern. But a broad sector here of the U.S. showing up drier overall into that week two pattern based on what I just showed you a few moments ago. Now, getting out beyond that, what about the end of the month of June? Again, these two feature, this feature here, excuse me, showing up in both models is one thing I'm going to have to spend some time analyzing this week because it seems to be a dominant trough feature sitting somewhere near the Aleutian Islands. And depending on the wavelength of the jet stream flow, that could really set up the Midwest to be active, the primary corn belt to be active, maybe with some northwest flow and quite a bit of thunderstorm activity, or it could completely shut things down if that ridge pushes back toward the central plains more. All right. So we're going to have to watch both of those things because it's a critical time period where we need to be receiving, you know, as you all know, regular rainfall. So let's just talk about our setup going into this. This is calculated soil moisture anomalies. Now, what I want to do is I want to overlay on top of this my concerns and thoughts over the next two weeks. OK, I am very concerned about this area and flash drought and expansion of drought. We do know that over here in the Eastern Corn Belt, overall we're drier over the next 15 days, but you're gonna see in a few moments, no extreme heat that's coming in there. We have Cristobal's rains plus a near that, that secondary low sweeping through and then some cooler weather behind it that's gonna be hitting this region from basically the Delta to the Great Lakes states and then back over to the Eastern Dakotas. But I really, it's, I'm gonna to have to watch carefully to see what happens in the Central and Western Dakotas with this unsettled pattern coming through in the Pacific Northwest, which is going to keep it cooler. So these are my concerns long range. And I'm going to come back to this idea of expecting drought because looking at the next seven days of total evaporation, the heat doesn't really subside here too much. And with the extremely windy conditions coming through, I'm concerned about some well, high evaporation rates. You can see it goes off my charts here uh, in places. So we, we've got to watch that area extremely carefully as we progress through the month of June for expanding drought. Okay, let's talk temperatures next. Here's Monday's high temperatures. You can see the effect of the cloud cover from Cristobal here. You can see the deeper trough out west, finally letting those temperatures come back above freezing. But look at this, triple digit heat in Texas, 90s coming up through the central plains, 90s getting all the way here out ahead of that stalled frontal boundary right in through this area, which is what's going to feed the instability later today. Going from Monday over into Tuesday, the front advances, as you can see here. And yeah, you get a cool down right here, but don't get too used to it, all right? Uh, the heat pushes east, still triple digit heat in southern Texas, watch this, this is Tuesday, now into Wednesday, already starting to rebuild as much of the central plains and Midwest begin to cool off a bit. Going from Wednesday into Thursday, now we're back up into the 90s, right again, right? And still cooler finish to the week in this part of the Corn Belt. And then as we press into the day on Friday, and then into Saturday, and Sunday, you see the heat staying on here, the next trough sweeping into the west, the first trough trying to exit here in the Great Lakes states. So this is the cooler pattern. How long does it last? Well, let's look out here to the day six through 10. Okay, we just saw that we were finishing with that cooler pattern, but the heat was already building back up in the central plains out ahead of the next trough sweeping into the northwest. There is a little bit of model disagreement as we get out a little bit farther here into day 11 through 15. The GFS brings in a deeper trough here and a much sharper ridge in the middle part of the country, but then lets it fall back off over the east, whereas the European takes a bit of a flatter flow overall. And uh, as it brings a bit of a trough in here, keeps the jet stream farther to the north, but I think it's just greater spread in the ensemble members that are giving us that scene, which is why we do notice much above, well, excuse me, above average temperatures, not much above, but slightly above average temperatures in that region I just put in the oval. Okay, what we need to be talking about this week. One, the MJO, which went racing through phase four, five, six, seven, eight over the last uh, 20 days or so, has just stopped right here. That's going to be critical for our pattern moving forward. The global atmospheric angular momentum is now below zero, 
But much of that west to east momentum loss is in the southern hemisphere. We got to discuss that later on this week. And then we got to talk about what's going on with La Nina because there is the zero line on our southern oscillation index. And we watched over last week and into early this week the southern oscillation index go back below zero. All right. So what does that mean? What's going on here in terms of wind speeds? I'm going to discuss all of that as well as the ocean temperatures here in the North Pacific as being major clues as to the eventual summer pattern. We're going to get to that on Wednesday. Okay, so tune back in. What I want to finish up was a quick international update. On the left, I have the European model next 10 days precipitation. Very unsettled from the Iberian Peninsula through Poland, getting all the way down here just to the east of the Black Sea. What you notice is in parts of Ukraine, though, getting over to this part of Russia, drier conditions are in the forecast for the next 10 days, and the heat is really coming up after a cool May and a cloudy May, all right? Finally, I'm going to finish with what's going on in South America. The large area through here where you see no precipitation, where they're harvesting a safrina crop right now, that's normal. Okay, the monsoon is done. These rains down here in southern Brazil are too much too late. And it's impacting harvest in parts of Paraná, Rio Grande do Sul, Uruguay, and sections of Argentina. Outside of that, the rest of Argentina, very seasonable precipitation. And we might be starting to bring in frost concerns in southern Argentina as we push into the middle of this month. Okay, a lot to just take in there. I really appreciate your attention this morning. Hope you all have a great week, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.